Welcome to The Lead, the New Lines magazine podcast. I'm Faisal Yafai, and this is a podcast where we delve into some of the biggest ideas, events and personalities in the Middle East and beyond. In our episode on urbanism, we called the concept of the city one of the Middle East's greatest contributions to world history. But urban civilization is only a part of the human story. For thousands of years, most humans were nomads, living their lives on the move. They were raiders and traders, herders and hunters. It was nomads who domesticated the horse and nomads who used it to become some of history's greatest conquerors. From Genghis Khan to Osman I, nomads changed the course of history on numerous occasions. And yet, as Anthony Satin, historian, travel writer, and today's podcast guest says, we still tend to underestimate their influence. His book, Nomads, The Wanderers Who Shaped Our World, puts nomads back at the very center of world history. Anthony, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Faisal. Joy, a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I wanted to start by asking you about this word nomad. It's a broad term which describes a variety of ways of life. So what do you mean when you talk about nomads? It is a very broad term and it's a very, very old word. It goes back early Indo-European. Um, and the, the first meaning, which is the meaning that I, I refer to mostly in the book, is one of somebody going in search of pasture. So therefore a herder who needs to, to feed their flock. Mm. Uh, obviously, in our own time, I mean, it has all sorts of other connotations, digital nomads and, and whatever. But, uh, but I think for most of history, it has been people who live lightly on the move because they need to be able to move around often very often um, between two quite fixed places. I mean, it could be a, lot, a, a great distance apart, but um, in search of summer and winter grazing. Yeah, we'll come to that bit about, because I think that, that part will surprise people when we get to it. But you, you say that the commonly held narrative of world history excludes or underplays the role that these nomadic people played. Um, and that they've been, this is a quote, um, confined to the anecdotes and afterthoughts of our writers and histories. Do you want to expand on that part? Yes, I think um, there are several reasons for this, but uh, there's an Oxford historian um, who I shan't name. <laughs> I do name him <laughs> in the book, who describes history as a path picked through ruins. Um, now, if that suggests that history is predicated uh, on people building monuments, and uh, as we know, most nomads don't build monuments, therefore the only role for nomads is as of destroyers, the creators of ruins. Mm. Um, and therefore, it's a negative one. And, and the other point about this is that um, nomads have tended not to write down their own, their own stories. Um, nobody did for an awfully long time in human history. Um, and nomads continued this and continue to this day, the idea of the oral tradition. Yeah. And therefore, when it came to writing down history, the people who wrote it were people who were settled. And they tended only to mention nomads uh, at the moments of conflict uh, when nomads came, you know, when there was, when there was wars and whatever. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they became the barbarian other. But this in no way reflects the, 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 the totality of the relationship between nomadic and settled, which for most of history has been complementary. They're, they're mutually dependent on each other. And so most of the time, it's been very happy. But what we have in our histories are the stories of, I mean, if you can name check, you know, three three great uh, nomads, it's going to be um, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, and 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 Timur or Tamerlane. Um, um, yeah, and, th and those and, would be the three. Yeah, those are the three, and they're usually associated with piles of skulls and millions of deaths. Hmm. Which I mean, is the true. one I mentioned. Sorry to interrupt. The one I no. mentioned in the intro, Osman the First, the founder yes. of the Ottoman Empire. I mean, even he. We would consider them, we think about it in the context of a settled empire, not in the context of this nomadic beginning. Yes, although the origins of, of, the, uh, of the Ottomans is absolutely nomadic. They're Turkic peoples. They originally came off this huge area, the, the, um, the Eurasian steppe that really stretches from Hungary the whole way to the Chinese border. Um, the, the Great Wall was built to keep out nomads off the steppes. And the Turk, the Turk, the Osman. Osmanli Turks are just one group that came came off the uh, the Indo-European steppes and pushed down into the richer pastures down on the plains. Um, but even during you know the height of the of the Ottoman Empire, when when the Sultan was happily living in the Topkapi Palace or wherever else, uh, the majority of people in the empire were still nomads, and for a very good reason. I mean, for the reason that some of them still are, and that is the landscape they live in 
simply doesn't allow for agriculture. You can only herd. Mm. I suppose since you've written an entire book on the nomadic way of life, you believe that in some way that lack of uh, the lack of appearance in our history means that we miss something. We have an unbalanced view of history and there's parts of it that we don't simply don't see. So in what important ways do you think nomads have shaped world history that perhaps we don't fully understand? Let's go right back to the beginning of, of settlement, um, to the uh, Neolithic or, or agricultural revolution, or which I, I think is more of an evolution than a revolution. The first monuments that we know of in uh, Gobekli Tepe and in that area of Turkey down near the Syrian border date back to about 9,500 BC, and they're built not by settled people, but by hunter-gatherers. Um, and they, out of this comes um, a sense of community, uh, agriculture, because although they start off being hunter-gatherers, the, the effort of, of building these huge monuments means that they, have, they, they hunt and gather everything in the, in the vicinity, and they end up domesticating wheat. I mean, the first strain of domesticated wheat has been found about 25 miles from, from Gobekli Tepe. Mm. And, and, and so the, the whole basis for a settled society has come out of, out of a nomadic one, and the, the sense of um, tribal and family identity, of, uh, of respect for your elder, and particularly your, your ruler, your leader, um, but also a sense of democracy. Many, um, many nomadic societies are much more democratic than many settled societies have been through history. Um, in that there's always been a council of elders and, and, and advisors, which has not always been present in settled society. And the role of women in, in most uh, nomadic um, societies has been, has been much more elevated than it was in settled society for most of history. Um, for Travel instance, being a great leveler. Yes, exactly. And I mean, whether we're talking about the fourth or third century uh, BC Scythians, you know, who, who there are, there are very important um, status burials for women among, among the Scythians, or whether it's uh, Genghis Khan, whose wife was absolutely central to the running of his empire, or whether it's Babur, the, the Mughal emperor, who, who wrote that whenever he, there was a big decision to make, he consulted his grandmother while she was alive, and her counsel was always the one that held and was always the best. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, there are many, many ways in which, in which nomads have helped shape our world today. Do you think there are insights then that we can gain from that history to better understand ourselves now? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a, a sense of um, crisis in, uh, that, that, well, I, that I see in our culture. I think the world that was created out of the age of reason and enlightenment and then fueled by the Industrial Revolution is coming to an end and we're on the way to something, something else, somewhere new. And as I write in, in the book, I don't think um, we can know who we're going to become unless we know who we were. And half of our story is missing because for most of, most of human history, nomads have been half of the story and yet they're not in our, in our, in our books. And, you know, my book is, I mean, it's relatively small. When, when I was discussing it with my editor, he was asking so, sort of with a quaking voice, how big is this book going to be? And I said, well, it's not, you know, it's not the definitive history of nomads. I just want to raise the question and make a few points about significant moments that we'll all recognize, whether it's the fall of the Roman Empire or, or, the, or the raising of, you know, the, the, the rise and fall of empires through what we in the West, what I was brought up to believe was the Dark Age, and you realize that it's actually a glorious age um, mm. el elsewhere in the world, that this, this has not been recognized properly. And, um, and I, I think my book is part of a new movement to, to sort of widen our understanding of, of who we have been. Who we have been, and do you think we need to widen our understanding of who we are, of what civilization actually is, and therefore, by extension, what it might mean to live a civilized life or live among, uh, live in a civilization? Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think um, th there was a wonderful book written uh, in the 1960s, The History of the City, um, and, and in it, the, the author suggests or, or raises the question, what will happen to the city? You know, will, it, will it destroy itself? Will it become so big that it won't be possible anymore? Well, now we have more than half of the almost 8 billion people on the planet living in cities. And um, 
we are no longer able to manage our effect on the planet. That's clear. The last few days, this extraordinary heat wave we've been having in Europe. Um, and I think it, we need to think differently about the things we've, we've taken for granted, the things that I was brought up to take for granted, you know, that I can acquire things, that I can, I can live in a, in, a how, in, a, in a house and have central heating blaring all winter, that I can do all these things. I can drive wherever I want and fill my car up and, and afford to do all this. All this as well and clearly that's becoming much much more difficult um and uh, i saw extinction rebellion today calling for um for saying that rather than get, giving up meat and and everything else you'd do better to eat one billionaire you'd 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 have a much more beneficial <laughs> much more <laughs> beneficial effect on the planet eat one billion which is just to say that our footprint has become increasingly big and i think uh looking at people who are forced to live lightly because nomads are obliged to more or less, not necessarily be able to carry but to be able to pack up their homes at least twice a year if they're just transhumans moving between summer and winter pastures and therefore they their um their footprints are much much smaller than than mine living in a city but do you think that is a reasonable a reasonable way forward because it does feel like you're we'd have to give up some things in order to live that kind of life well um something i i learned early on in life is that um everybody i knew um who who had a house had at least some part of it stuffed with things that they never used and um and <laughs> and i i i have been guilty of this as well but i have recently and in the course of of writing this book uh moved out of a house into a much smaller apartment for partly for this reason i want to live lighter i want to live more deliberately i don't want to be weighed down with things and i think i'm not alone i know lots and lots of people who feel this way about the the, the weight of what we've taken for granted and acquired yeah um, and i think i think there's a um no I, the, i've met a lot of nomads over the, i've been traveling um since my late teens in in the middle east and uh, north africa and um and i met a lot of nomads there but also in you know in in asia and and elsewhere and i i've never um i've never met a, a nomad who's wanted to have more in terms of possessions and yeah i've met an awful lot of people who live in cities who wish they lived more lightly and i think you know, there, there is something to be learned from this. Do you think personally that you would prefer the nomadic lifestyle or you're just thinking about your current lifestyle slimmed down? I, I'm, I don't think I'm a nomad. Um, I, <laughs> no, I, I, I was, you know, I'm a, I'm a son of, of antique dealers. My parents were, my parents collected everything, every scrap of paper I wrote on as a child, every, every picture, every item of clothes, everything they collected. So that's also, this is also part of, partly a response to that. And this mm -hmm. book is also partly a response to um, Brexit, which I was strongly against. And, and apart from anything else, I, I'm absolutely convinced that the world is a better place, a better place when, um, when we have open borders and the free movement of people and of ideas and labor. And that's one of the things that comes out of my Nomads book. And that is, you know, we talked about the, the reputation that someone like Genghis Khan or, or Tamerlane ha have, and that, you know, of killers, of barbarians, or whatever. But the great, some of the greatest moments of, of uh, free movement of ideas, of flourishing of art have been under these, these rulers who were completely committed to open borders, free movement of people, freedom of conscience. To among the Mongols, it didn't matter whether you were a Muslim or a Christian or a sky worshiper, it, it was irrelevant. Um, and, and also free movement of capital. I mean, there's a, there's a lovely story about Kublai Khan, who was Mongol, but the ruler of China, who found in his treasury a vast store of, of precious metal. I can't remember whether it was silver or gold, but he, he says, what's this doing here? You, you have to give this to people. You know, the, the people need, money, money needs to move, which is obviously um, something we, you know, our, our <laughs> bankers tell us today, yeah. but, but you, to hear it from a, to hear it from a, a Mongol Khan um, many, many centuries ago, it's revolutionary. And Kublai I, Khan wanted to give money back to people, meaning he was the original Tory. Yeah, exactly. And and let it no, and let it come back to us was his idea. You know, oh, he really was a Tory. Make it, yeah, make it work. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, yeah. I, I, you, you know, you mentioned something about your upbringing, and I thought I, I wanted to delve a bit into your own life because you spent a lot of your life on the move. But I wondered, and other travel writers do that. But I wondered uh, in what what made you so interested? As you say, you've been interested in spaces where nomads are for many, many years, and since your late teens. Yes. Well, I, you know, I'm I'm a um, grandson of uh, immigrants. And uh, and I think I suppose there was a sense of not really knowing quite where I where I came from and I wherever I've been I mean in England people have often said where are you from mm. um, uh, and many people assume in England assume I come from France and in France they say Italy and Italy they say Spain first time I arrived in Damascus they asked if I was Lebanese in Israel they asked if I was Palestinian and the Palestinians asked if I was Israeli and and there's always been a sense of well where am I from and and mm. I I've never been. Actually, the only place I've ever been where people turned around and said they thought I was from there was Algeria. But okay, uh, wow. I have no Algerian blood. No, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, some, I'm from the Black Sea, my family, um, and, and, cent and Central Europe. But I, I had therefore had a sense uh, as soon as I left school that I wanted to go traveling. But I had no intention of being a travel writer. I, I was, uh, and I, I don't really think of myself as a travel writer. I'm just, I just tell stories. And some of them have been true. Some of them I got paid to write about places I went traveling to, so I wasn't going to complain about that. And, and some of them I'd made up. So I, wrote, I started out writing fiction. That was my original intention. Mm. And it was the, the last book you wrote about uh, Lawrence of Arabia that gave you the idea to write this book. I was fascinated by um, a tribe that Lawrence had read about or heard about um, from Charles Doughty, the, you know, who was at that time, the beginning of the beginning of the 20th century was the grand old man of sort of Arabian experience. He'd written this, this sort of monumental tome, Travels in Arabia, Deserter. And uh, Doughty had talked about this tribe called the Beni Slave. And Lawrence, who this is before he becomes Lawrence of Arabia, when in the, before the First World War, when he's just left, left Oxford, he's working as an archaeologist down near the Syrian border in Turkey. Mm. on the Euphrates River, a, a Hittite site called Karkamish. And he said, when, when the dig is finished, he said, maybe I'm going to go and, and find the Beni Slave and travel with them and, uh, and write a book. And, and I thought while I was researching, obviously he didn't because the First World War intervened and then he became Lawrence of Arabia and his, you know, he, his life was in a way not his own anymore. But uh, so I thought when I finished the Lawrence book, I thought, I wonder what happened to the Beni Slave. And they do si still seem to exist, but obviously now is and they were at one point they were like the they were considered the nomads of the nomads really hardcore poor um they didn't herd they seemed to be sort of they hunted with salukis and mm. and and they were sort of the the tinkerers they but they were allowed to move across other tribes lands and so they moved uh seasonally from more or less from syria down into the hejaz and i thought wow what a what a story um but of course the uh, Islamic State, the Daesh, and, and various other things have main, meant that that sort of movement is no longer possible in that region. So uh, I, I thought, okay, well, maybe that's not something I'll do just yet. Um, okay, so you never did, I mean, look into it. You don't know if, they, if they're around. They must be, I suppose, if that, they're somewhere, they'll be in Saudi Arabia. I think they are still around, yes, and I think they are still in Saudi Arabia. Um, no, but, but the Nomads book got in the way, and it's sort of, I, I'm so happy I've written this book. I mean, it, it's... Uh, I mean, obviously, the response I've had has been wonderful, so I'm happy about that. But also, it was something I've been wanting to do for a long time, and that is write something ridiculously complicated. <laughs> 12,000 <laughs> 12, years of history. 12,000 uh, years, yeah. And there were obviously, you know, it, it took me how long? It's seven years. And, and obviously, there were certain moments, you know, and I, and I don't have an academic post, so, I, you know, I, I'm... I'm an independent writer. I needed to fund myself. But, uh, and there were moments during it, I was thinking, what? What on earth have I done? But now that I'm here, at the other end of it, and it is a, it is there, I'm I'm very happy that it's that it's out there because it really hasn't been done before, and I think um, there is a value in that. Um, and and until somebody writes the definitive, you know, fifty volume work on on nomads, I think my book will stand. Well, you say I mean twelve thousand years, but actually you would have had to work with very little written down. This old saying that history is written by the victors it's actually history is written by the writers and so even though some of the nomad cultures that you discuss have been literate on the whole the societies that have kept substantial written records were sedentary societies 
That's right. That's absolutely right. And um, for instance, I, I, I had great fun stitching together the stories of um, the Scythians in, in, in the west of Eurasia and the Xiongnu um, up against in Mongolia and up against the Chinese border. So this is from about the 5th, 4th century BC up to about the 2nd century AD. So the time of the Roman Empire and, the, and Han China. Um, and Herodotus wrote, wrote about um, the Scythians, and he writes about how, for instance, uh, the Emperor Cyrus, the Persian Emperor, loses his head, and how um, in in battle with the Scythians, and how Darius invades Scythian land with an intention of conquering them, but they keep on moving away from him, and uh, eventually he, you know, he's he's got this vast army with this with with um, an ever stretched supply line. And so eventually, 700,000, uh, 700, 700, 700, 700, yeah, 700,000, yeah, which that's what Herodotus be, said. It might uh, be a slight exaggeration. Yeah, but, it sounds like quite a big army. But so Darius sends, you know, sends a, a, a fast messenger to the Scythian king to say, why won't you fight? And the Scythian king said, why would we? I mean, we don't have any crops you can burn. We don't have any cities you can trash. So, and in the end, Darius gave up. So on the one on the on the western side of, of this vast expanse between the Roman and the Chinese Empire, there was that. And and on on the eastern side, there's the Xiongnu, who are written about by the this uh, historian called the Grand his, the Great Historian of China. Hmm. And the stories they tell, and the people they describe are are so similar that they they if they're not the same people, they are. And we don't know what either the Scythians or the Xiongnu called themselves. For instance, wow, the Xiong okay. Xiongnu was certainly not called the Xiongnu because it's a Chinese word that means the illegitimate offsprings of slaves. So I can't see themselves calling themselves that. <laughs> right. um, but but they in the in Xiongnu burials and in Scythian burials, you find similar objects. You find Chinese silk, whether it's therefore up up near over near the Danube or over near the Great Wall of China. You find um, you find weavings. You find gold jewelry, which uh, which appears to have been made um, on the edge of Europe by Byzantine Roman or Byz later Byzantine um, jewelers. If you saw the Scythian exhibition at the British Museum, you'll you'll know, which is about five years ago. They have beautiful things there, and so there there seems to be a similarity. And my suggestion is that there's an alliance, and maybe what we could all call, almost call a nomad empire. That sits between the Roman and the Chinese Han Chinese Empire, and right. might have might have been larger than both. And you think, wow! I mean, okay, the, I can't go any further than that. But archaeology is moving very fast at the moment, and it's a it, it, very exciting what is being found. And it might be possible before too long to prove that there is this empire that we isn't simply not in our in our history books. Um, and yeah, in, we in might. The, yeah. And if there's that, which is a nomad empire, then then imagine what else we're missing. Yeah, I mean, I have a. I wanted to run a little pet theory of mine by you and see see what you think, because yeah. um, I, I there are all these spaces in the world that are occupied by people, but because historically we, they haven't written anything down, we don't know what happened. So North Africa is is one part of it. A lot of nomadic tribes moving down into West Africa. I've always believed that we would find the the written records of encounters with these people in Timbuktu. I've always <laughs> felt that the Arabs would have written some of it down, even if it was just interacted with them on the margins, and that we might actually find some record of them um, there. Well, yes, uh, except you know the the the. I mean, there are still manuscripts coming out of Timbuktu that have not been studied yet. But um, I mean, I wrote a book. Uh, some years ago called The Gates of Africa, which was looking at um, Joseph Banks' 1780s and his Enlightenment friends, hmm. um, looking for Timbuktu and uh, sending people traveling to look for Timbuktu on, on the basis that it was a slur on the Age of Enlightenment that the Greeks and Romans knew more about the interior of the African continent than, than these gentlemen in London in the 18th century did. Um, and that, you know, it's a, it's a great Enlightenment project. They want to know everything. Um, and yet, Neither they nor I, and I spent quite a bit of time traveling in and talking to academics in in Mali and Senegal and and Gambia um, about this. About you know where is the history of of these nomads? And as one academic in Senegal pointed out, well, it's still oral history, and and therefore 
the stories may well still being, be being told, but the research hasn't been done. And I think since that book, which was already now almost getting on for 20 years ago, I think there has been research done into the oral history of that part of the world with a view to trying to recover some of the history of the nomad tribes. We might end up finding out that, as you were saying about this large confederation that stretched east and west, it might turn out that actually the history of these empires needs to be rewritten to incorporate some of these nomadic empires. Well, it's also that, you know, we glorify, um, and, and this is not to, this is not to, to lessen the, the, you know, the huge achievements of settled society. I mean, I, I, I do live in a home, <laughs> <Right. I'm>, <laughs> but, but it's just hot the, water. It was, yes, exactly. Electricity and, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, where, whereas, you know, uh, there's a lovely st story that, that T. Lawrence tells when he brings, um, one of the Syrians to Oxford and, and asks him what he would like to take home. And he says, I'd like to take home that thing you have in the wall. You just turn it and hot water comes out. Mm. We don't, we don't have those where we live. Um, no, but, but um, our histories glorify people who build monuments. And uh, coming back to this comment from the Oxford historian, um, you know, we value, uh, we value the Egyptians for building their extraordinary temples and tombs and pyramids. Um, mm. We don't tend to value tribes in the Amazon, for instance, who didn't chop down their forest, who maintained a, the, a, a, an equilibrium, who lived happily without and, and flourished, with it, but without disturbing the, the ecological balance in, in their world. And it could yeah, be I, mm. in 50, it could be in 50 years time, if, if this warming cycle that we're going through, and I'm sure it is a cycle, it will, it will end. But if it, if it, if it becomes prolonged and, and, and the consequences become even more dramatic, it could be that somebody in 50 years' time will be writing histories about the people who didn't chop down forests and who, did main, and who also didn't build cities. And, and yeah, I, I've heard you make that point, actually, and I thought the audience didn't seem to sort of latch onto it, but I thought it was very interesting that this idea that, that there is a way to, to live as a civilization that just involves tending what you have. It doesn't involve transmogrifying it into something else. Yeah, and I mean, I have to say, I mean, I've done my my fair share of glorifying um, monument builders. So, I, and I, you know, there are there are wonderful things that humans have built. Um, but I remember that being uh, the first time, for instance, I went to India to to Varanasi to Benares, and the Burning Ghat, this place where where uh, people bring bodies to be to be burnt. Um, the, the, I was told the flame has been kept burning for since before the pyramids were built. Wow! <laughs> and I, I don't know if that's true or if that's an exaggeration, but anyway, let's just say it's been only been go, burning for a thousand years. That suggests a whole different a way of looking at human achievement. Right, the ability to maintain something rather yeah. than build something in its place. Yes, exactly. And the ability to maintain something without, with, without destroying everything around you. We've talked a lot about the role of nomads in history, but of course, we still have nomads with us today. And I wanted to ask you about the, the way nomads interact with the modern world. So now I think there are currently, well, <laughs> I was going to say there are 40 million nomads, but actually the very nomadic lifestyle they live means it's very difficult to know. But that's about the size of the population of Spain, for example, or Poland. So as much as they have been marginalized by historians, they're also still marginalized in the present. They are. Um, yes, that, that's for sure. I mean, I gave a talk recently and the idea of there being nomads or transhumans in Europe was a, was a huge surprise to people, Europeans. Um, and because they're just not part of our vision. And obviously, if you take a wider view, there's travelers, there's, you know, there, there's um, in, the, in the United States, there's a vast number of people who live out of trucks, you know, there's a, um, yeah. by which I mean, you know, sort of mobile homes. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, uh, what's it called? We, wheel estate, not real estate. Sorry, that's what they call it. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the film Nomad Land really, really sort of tapped into that. But, um, but that wasn't, the, the Nomad Lands part wasn't really by choice. It was a, a recognition that hard times have pushed people away from real estate. So it's still glorifying the idea of real estate. Well, I, I think, I think this, I mean, the, the choice thing is really interesting. I mean, I, I, I said that there are places in, on the planet where 
you simply can't farm. Um, and therefore, they, the, it's that sort of place, for instance, on the edge of the Sahara, on the Sahel, um, where you find nomads, or in Iran, um, where you know, a huge amount of Iran is, is just not suitable for agriculture, which is why they've always had such a huge um, nomadic population. Uh, there was a wonderful moment uh, discussing the building of Persepolis, the great ancient Persian building, for instance, um, on, with Melvin Bragg on, on In Our Time, where uh, Mel, Melvin Bragg said, so when did the Persians stop being nomadic? And there was sort of awkward silence. And one of the academics around the table said, well, they never stopped being nomadic because they couldn't, mm. because the, the land doesn't allow it. And that is clearly the case in, in lots of places on, on, on our planet. Um, and it's uh, therefore this land will either be wasteland or you'll have people grazing their herds over it. And that um, 40 million, I was wondering, I was trying to find out how many nomads there were and therefore what the population on the planet was um, in 9,500 BC at the time of the um, building of Gobekli Tepe. And I couldn't, but I wonder whether it was a, a lot, lot more than 40 million. Um, and therefore, I was wondering whether the nomad population has increased or decreased over the last 12,000 years. We know what the settled population has done. It's, it's exploded. Yeah. Um, but it could be that uh, nomads have just maintained themselves. And they're still, I mean, I, I've been, I write in, in my book about uh, Bakhtiari, um, and, and I chose to write about Bakhtiari. I could have written about nomads in Egypt or, or elsewhere, but I chose to write about the Bakhtiari partly because, well, partly because the, the land they, they move across is so beautiful and they were so welcoming to me when I, I first went before I started working on this book. And then when I started working, I thought, okay, I'll go back and see what's happening with those people. And also because they, they, their tradition goes back at least to the time of the Persian Empire, therefore, you know, at, le at least two, two and a half thousand years and maybe, maybe a lot more. Um, and they're still very, very, very active. Um, I mean, for, for nostalgics, there's a, there's a problem because a lot of them are not going by foot or, or horse or donkey or whatever up, up and down the mountain. Mm -hmm. They go on a truck, um, and they, but they still they spend their winters down on the Mesopotamian plain down near the Iraqi border because in the winter that's good for, for grazing and also um, they can raise their they can raise a, a crop of wheat, and in the sun, when when things start heating up and the grass starts burning, then they'll pack up and they'll go up into the mountains where the snow has usually melted by that time, and where there's grazing up on the up on the high pastures, and you know there's this is wonderful equilibrium between the two, and it's also ironic that it was on these people's territory on the Bakhtiari territory that the first oil strike was made in the Middle East, and of course. The oil and the combustion engine has so transformed our world that uh, that it, that nomads in a mo in a uh, a world fueled by combustion engine or jet engine seem an anachronism, and yet there they are. They're still going up and down the mountain. And but well, when they go up and down the the mountain, they when they come down in the winter, they live in houses. You wrote, but when yeah. they go up, do they live in alternative housing? They're summer houses. Houses, the houses are, are, are very basic, and some of them are still wintering in, in tents. Um, and, and when they go up, they're living in tents uh, up, on the, up in, the, in the Zagros Mountains. So it's um, kind of, it's like they have two homes rather than they're nomadic in the Bedouin sense. Ex exactly that. But I think even, even Bedouin, uh, many Bedouin um, families or tribes will move between, you know, they have their, they will go in into the further into the desert in 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 the winter because it, it's possible there's better grazing and it's and you can you can survive in there and when it gets too hot in the summer they'll move out to the edges uh, but they tend to to you know move in the same areas they i mean most nomads don't just go wandering aimlessly all over the place I actually thought that the section where you talk about you spend time with the Bakhtieri and then you come down from the mountains and when you get back into town, you say that you suddenly notice the presence of these boundaries of these fences and the walls and suddenly the presence of the state was really in your face and you noticed it in a way that you hadn't. You lived quite an unbounded life previously with them. Yes, it's absolutely, you know, when, when there's just... Uh... 
you and them and the other people in their tribe they'll they will know lots of people who live around them um and and the mountains um you know and and obviously the mountains have they have their limits as well but it's a really i mean you know but it's it was be- it was beautiful and it was literally unbounded um and i quote a, a line from byron about uh, who who seemed to know this that the, the the persians you know persians chose the mountain tops for their altars and uh you know because that's where the, that's where the the deity or the spirits or or freedom of spirit is to be found and that's it certainly the, what i felt and certainly seemed to be the, the case with the with the nomads that i was up there with i mean very very much felt you know they're at the end of their migration and some of them had come literally herding their animals at overland um and and it, it felt like this is the beginning of the summer holiday mm-hmm. <laughs> we we almost touched on this at the beginning but then we got diverted but i wanted to go back to this idea that the settled world is very hostile um to to nomadic people so the tuareg in mali um the bedouin in the negev in israel indigenous people these people that you were talking about the americans who, who have real estate of course the romani in eastern europe in all of these places, the governments are trying to discourage that way of life and kind of force them into settled communities. And I wondered why you thought governments were so hostile to people like that. Well, it's quite difficult to um, control, which is to say to, yeah, firstly, to to keep an eye on and secondly, to tax uh, people who aren't a fixed abode. Um, Although uh, you know, the, in in Iran there is a there's a ministry that looks after nomads and they seem to seem to run things pretty well and and I would point out I think a third of Iran's meat is produced in the mountains, not necessarily all by nomads but a, a huge amount of it comes comes from nomads so there is a dependency on this there's a sort of a need for it as as there always has been but what light really lies behind this is the age old sense of who are these people they are. Where have they come from? Where are they going? Why have they come here? They are not known. And, and whether it's um, now or whether it was a uh, hundred years ago when, when the, the great uh, Alexandrian poet Cavafy wrote his Waiting for the Barbarians, or whether it was 2,500 years ago when the this lovely story of a Sumerian princess who decides she's going to marry a nomad and her friends are all aghast and say, you can't. I mean, you know, he 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 wears leather, and you know, and 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 all these things. You know, he, and he eats raw meat, and he doesn't know how to say his prayers properly. And when he, <laughs> there, are, there are plenty of people in Camden wearing leather and not eating. Meat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and but the the final thing is he is not known, and this mm. is such a it's such an interesting thing, you know, because obviously in settled community, you know who lives well. You used to know. I mean, obviously in big cities we don't anymore. We used to know who lived down oh, the but road. The state probably. does. I mean that's yes. part of the that's part of what makes a system of government. You know, it's based around borders and censuses and citizenship, where the state does know who is who and where they are. That's right, and and so the state. I mean, and Iran, but I saw it happening in Egypt. I saw it happening in in Syria and elsewhere. Um, the state encourages rather than necessarily forces settlement by offering children of nomads uh, free education. Um, but to be educated, you have to be in one place. And therefore, for instance, in Iran, the, with the Bakhtiari, there was the option of, of going to a boarding school, a state-sponsored boarding school. Mm. And if you're a nomad and you're thinking about um, your child in the 21st century, you might think, actually, I, you know, an education would be a good thing. Um, and the other thing is it's for elderly people or, or the sick. And that is, if you want health care, you need to be near a hospital. And you need yeah. to be in, you need and and that so these two things are the sort of beginning of life and end of life stuff. The state, um, and I, as I said, I, I've seen this in many places, sort of waves these these carrots, um, settle, and your children will be educated, and your you your elderly or you when you become old will be looked after. You say that they're they're carrots, but. You know, I, I sometimes think we might romanticize that way of life a bit too much because it's so different to our own. I mean, there, you know, you mentioned, because we were talking about nomads, you, you mentioned ISIS. Actually, there's a big reason why people prefer settled communities. And one of those reasons is that it provides security. Uh, I don't know. Does it? 
the last US president, who we'll leave unnamed, um, said, you know, without 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 strong borders, you don't have a country. And yet he absolutely failed to build build the border along the, the Mexican frontier. Um, and lots of people come through there. And uh, what security? Uh, I don't know one wall that has ever physical wall that has ever worked in terms of security. I mentioned that the Chinese began building the Great Wall of China um, to keep the Xiongnu out. It didn't work. Of course, they went around it. But it didn't work. I mean, it, it didn't work in the sense that they were able to trickle through, but they were not able to just walk in as they would have done if there were no wall. It's the same with this thing. So I was going to ask you about this relationship between freedom of movement, which, of course, you mentioned regarding Brexit, and then sort of freedom more generally. Because you do have a situation now where borders are so tightly controlled, especially in the rich world. And you mentioned you know, the American border, the Rio Grande, of course, the Mediterranean, people still trying to come across. You, there's On the one hand, there's a sense that freedom of movement is an incredibly basic freedom, but it is one that actually is not well distributed. It's very limited in the modern world. But on the other hand, there's a logic to why you have to limit freedom of movement, because the goods that you were talking about, um, education, healthcare, the, and the one that I mentioned, policing, for example, those things do rely on a sense of how many people there are and how many taxes are paid and so on. Yes, I agree. And, and obviously, um, the freedom of movement that I was talking about, for instance, with, with Brexit is to do with... Um, you know, I, I believed, I, I still believe I'm a European. Um, I'm married to a, a citizen of the European Union. Um, I, I put my children into a French school. Uh, and, I, and therefore, I'm extremely offended to discover that, that I can only spend six months in Europe and they have to apply for visas to, to get in here. And th yeah. you know, this, this seems, th this doesn't seem, but in terms of security, I mean, I, I think... Um, Oh, we live in such a strange world at the moment, uh, you know, with what's happening in Ukraine and, and whatever. But you look at uh, the, the threats to security in the United States, and it's mostly from look, citizens carrying, carrying weapons. Um, and the state doesn't seem to be able to manage that very well. Um, but, and, and obviously, I agree with, uh, if you look at what's happening in, in uh, West Africa at the moment, uh, you know, with Mali and the, 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 the mess of of movement of arms and drugs and people across the Sahara. Um, yeah. yeah, that's, that's, that is clearly a, a major problem. And it is a problem that's going to, we're going to, we are going to feel in Europe, um, you know, ever, ever more keenly as time goes on. But I think that, um, I, I, I still don't believe that the, the, you know, the, the basic idea of the European Union, for instance, of, with freedom of movement in that, was that labour would f go in search of, of, of the vacant jobs. And if there were no jobs in one place, then it would move to another place. Yeah. Um, and, what, and what the United Kingdom did in put, putting up its barriers was, was effectively disrupt that, which is why we now have shortages in everything from you know, road hauliers to the National Health Services, the fruit pickers, because those people used to come, do the job, and then go away again. Yeah, 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 exactly. In the sense, they were nomadic. They came for a few months, and yeah, exactly. They were yeah. they were seasonal. Yes, exactly. I mean, in a modern sense of the term nomadic, if you dump the pastoralist part, <laughs> they were looking yeah. for work. Actually, it's probably quite an unfair thing to say to them because when they came for those three months or four months, they didn't really feel settled. They didn't really have a home. They were just working. I think so. That's right. Yes, that was a pretty bad system, actually. Um, do you think that the, these nomadic lifestyles can survive long term? Or do you think when you look at the numbers, I, I forget where it was, but, you know, what is it now? 7.6 billion people, 8 billion people versus 40 million nomadic. Like it feels like that thousand year long conflict between those two groups of peoples. I mean, the settles have won those that conflict. That, that's what I thought when I started this book. Um, and, and I did. Uh, actually, I remember, my, you know, before I started writing, my editor saying, you know, this is going to be really depressing at the end. <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> and, exactly. Yeah. And I and I and I thought, yeah, it's going to be really, it's going to be really bad. But I, I, you know, the the world is a is a, a very large and wonderful place, and we have extraordinary diversity among us. And I can't see why um, nomads won't survive for another thousand years. I simply, you know, that however hard things get. 
for them that the world there's so much land that that can't be farmed and is too far away from either transport or city for to be used for industry or whatever else what else are you going to do with it mm. um it could yeah i mean that it's going to be it, it's perfect land for for herders and we that's need a, yeah that's we, a hugely interesting theory that you could actually imagine lots of people becoming nomadic in order to make use of this as the cities get more cramped Yes, of course. I mean, the, the, we saw unimaginable flight of people out of cities uh, in the last two years because of because of a, a virus. I mean, imagine if people caught on to this idea that 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 you could earn your bed and board much more efficiently, it was much less taking up much less time and leaving you a lot more time therefore for leisure. If you got out of the city and and did something else, uh, I mean, I'm not suggesting that we. I'm that this. <laughs> I keep on saying I'm not an anti. You know, I'm not anti-city <laughs> and I'm not anti-settled society. But I just think <laughs> when I started on this journey of writing this book, all the you know many many years ago, I I hadn't. I'm I've been so surprised by what I've discovered along the way, and and also by the fact that I just hadn't thought about it for so long. I mean, for most of my life, it just. I mean, when when you're I mean, when I moved, started when I moved to Cairo, for instance, and and lived in lived in Egypt, it, it did occur to me then because I was traveling around the country a lot that there was this nomad fringe, and that, and that was part of the fascination. And therefore, when I looked at the conflict in Darfur, for instance, um, with the Janjaweed, it it's a conflict between settled and nomadic people. It's a conflict mm -hmm. over the right to to graze and access to water. Um, and you know, and suddenly the world begins to look very different. I wanted to finish off by asking you about climate change, because over the next fifty years or so, I mean, our societies are going to face massive migration in the face of these disruptions, and we're going to have to change a lot of things about how we live, including where we live. And so, I wondered if you think we've kind of touched on it, but I wonder if you think that climate change might be a way to force people towards this more nomadic lifestyle. Um, but I actually really wanted to ask if you thought that climate change could be thought of as a failure of sedentary society. Oh, un undoubtedly, it's a failure of sed sedentary society. I mean, it's not as if the science hasn't been there. Um, the problem is one of political will, um, and political will depends on um, enough people being, enough voters being prepared to make sacrifices. And uh, it's been we've been able to persuade ourselves that it's that all this climate change thing is theoretical. Um, what's happened in in Europe in the last week or, or two is is a you know has made people aware actually that it's not theoretical. Uh, this is going to happen a lot more often. And I'm not suggesting that that all this is happening because of you know because of of, of human intervention. What's happened, what appears to have happened, the science shows, is that. The natural cycles of heating and cooling, which have gone on throughout recorded history, have just got much faster and more extreme. Um, but when you know when we when we have fires on you know the, the most dramatic day in London yesterday, more incidents, uh, thousands of firefighters, hundreds of fire trucks, houses catching fire because of you know because of wildfires coming. We've never seen this before. Yes, and and I think this it. it I can't see another way of explaining it than saying it's a failure of settled society, and it's a failure to do in a way with um, our politicians not being brave enough to stand up and say this is going to hurt you, but you're going to have to do it because if you don't, it's going to hurt you even even or your children or your grandchildren further down the line. And then maybe the the nomadic societies that we have talked about they might actually thrive under those conditions. They might actually be part of the solution to some degree. Well, yes, exactly. That that great line from from the poet Kavafi about them being some kind of solution. I mean, I do think that uh, one of the things that uh, that that I write about is this idea of nomadic thinking, um, which is to say, uh, most of our education and most of our work r requires us to do repetitive things, um, and uh, you know, and to to. To, to say our times table and to write, you know, A's and B's exactly the same size over and over and again. Uh, and we are encouraged to um, to think towards a single point, whereas most nomads 
think much more divergently. They need a whole range of possible solutions to an ever-changing set of conditions. Um, and I mean, obviously, this is hugely generalized, but I think the point does stand. Um, and I think that moving forward, uh, it would be very interesting to to have some input from nomadic thinkers as to how we might get ourselves out of the hole that we've dug, dug for ourselves. Anthony Sutton, thank you very much. Faisal, thank you very much. Very much enjoyed that. You can buy Anthony's most recent book, Nomads, The Wanderers Who Shaped Our World, in all good bookshops. This week's episode was produced by Joshua Martin and Kristin Olhuli. It was hosted by me, Faisal Yafai. For more like this, subscribe to The Lead on your favorite podcast app or visit our website, newlinesmag.com. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs>